Ludwig von Mises wrote in 1919 that, quote, one can say without exaggeration that inflation is the indispensable means of militarism. Without it, the repercussions of war on welfare become obvious much more quickly and penetratingly. War weariness would set in much earlier, unquote. Of course, there's always a price to be paid for funding war through central banks. The post-war situation in America was a classic case. There was inflation. There were massive dislocations. There was recession, or what was then called depression, a direct result of capital dislocation that masked itself as an economic boom, but which was then followed by a bust. The depression hit in 1920, but it is not a famous event in US economic history. Why is that? Because the Federal Reserve had not yet acquired the means to manufacture an attempt to save the economy. Instead, neither the Fed, nor Congress, nor the President did much of anything about it, a wholly praiseworthy response. As a result, the Depression was brief and became a footnote to history. The same would have happened in 1930 had Herbert Hoover not attempted to use the government as the means of resuscitation. Sadly, the easy recovery from 1920 tempted the central bank to get back into the business of inflation. With the eventual result of a stock market boom that led to a bust, then depression, and finally the destruction of the gold standard itself. And FDR found that even fascist style economic planning and inflation could not restore prosperity. So he turned to the ancient method of looking for a war to enter. Here is where the history of the United States and the Fed intersects with the tragic role of the German Central Bank. The German government also funded its great war through inflation. By war's end, money in circulation had risen fourfold. Yet on international exchange, the German mark had not suffered as much as might have been expected. The German government looked at this with encouragement and promptly attempted to manufacture a complete economic recovery through inflation. Incredibly, by 1923, the German mark had fallen to one trillionth of its 1914 gold value. The US dollar was then equal to 4.2 trillion marks. It was an example of currency destruction that remains legendary in the history of the world, all made possible by a central bank that obliged the government and monetized the war debt. But did people blame the printing press? No. A popular explanation dealt with the Treaty of Versailles. It was the harsh peace imposed by the Allies that had brought Germany to the brink of total destruction, or so it was believed. Mises himself had written a full book that he hoped would explain that Germany owed its suffering to war and socialism, not Versailles as such. He urged the German people to look at the real causes and to establish free markets, lest he felt imperial dictatorship be the next stage in Germany's political development. But he was ignored, and the result, we all know, was Hitler. Turning to Russia, the untold truth about the Bolshevik Revolution is that Lenin's greatest propaganda tool involved the horrendous suffering of the Russian people during World War I. Men were drafted and killed at an unbelievable level. Lenin called this capitalist exploitation based on his view that the war had resulted from capitalist motives. In fact, it was a foreshadowing of the world that socialism would bring about, a world in which all people and all property are treated as means to statist ends. And what made the prolongation of the Russian role in World War I possible was an institution created in 1860 called the State Bank of the Russian Empire, that is, the Russian version of the Fed. The Russian war itself was funded through massive increases in the money supply, which led to massive price increases, shortages, and then totalitarian controls imposed during the war. Now, I'm not of the opinion, as the neocons are, the Russian monarchy was an evil regime that needed to be overthrown, if even by communism, but the temptation that the money machine provided the regime 
provided, proved too inviting, it turned a monarchy that might have otherwise been benign into a total war machine. A country that had long been integrated into the worldwide division of labor and was under a gold standard became a killing machine. And as horrific and catastrophic as the war dead were for Russian morale, the inflation affected every single person and inspired massive unrest that led to the triumph of communism. At this juncture in history, we can see what central banking has brought to us. It was not an end to the business cycle. It was not merely more liquidity for the banking system. It was not an end to bank runs and bank panics. And it certainly wasn't scientific public policy. The world's major economies were being lorded over by money monopolies. And the front men had become some of the worst despots in the history of the world. Now they were preparing to fight each other with all the resources they had at their disposal. The resource they, resources they did not have at their disposal, they would pay for with their beloved machinery of central banking. In wartime, the printing presses ran overtime. And with a totalitarian level of rationing, price controls, and all-round socialization of resources in the whole of the Western world. The result of inflation was not merely rising prices. It was vast suffering and shortages in Britain, Russia, Germany, Italy, France, Austria-Hungary, America, and pretty much the entire planet. So we can see here the amazing irony of central banking at work. The institution that was promoted by economists working with bankers in the name of bringing rationality and science to bear on monetary matters had given birth to the most evil political trends in the history of the world. Communism, socialism, fascism, Nazism, and the despotism of economic planning in the capitalist West. The story of central banking is but one step removed from the story of atomic bombs and death camps. There is a reason the state has been unrestrained since 1913. And that reason is the precise one that many people think of as a purely technical issue that is too complicated for mere mortals. Fast forward to the war on Iraq, which is all the features of a conflict born of the power to print money. There was a time when the decision to go to war involved debates in the House of Commons or the US House of Representatives. And what was this debate about? It was about resources and the power to tax. But once the executive state was unhinged from the need to rely on tax dollars and did not have to worry about finding willing buyers for all its unbacked debt instruments, the political debate about war was silenced. In the entire run up to his war, George Bush just assumed as a matter of policy that it was his decision alone whether to invade Iraq. The objections by Ron Paul and a few other members of Congress and vast numbers of the American population was reduced to little more than white noise in the background. Imagine if Bush had had to raise the money for the war through taxes. It never would have happened. But he didn't have to. He knew the money would be there. So despite a $200 billion deficit, a $9 trillion debt, $5 trillion in outstanding debt instruments held by the public, a federal budget of $3 trillion, and falling tax receipts in 2001, Bush contemplated a war that has cost, by the government statistics, $525 billion, or $4,681 per household. Imagine if he had gone to the American people to request that. What would have happened? I think we know the answer to that question. And, the, and those, as I say, are the government figures. The actual cost of this war will be far higher, perhaps as much as $20,000 per household. Now, when left liberals talk about these figures, they like to compare them with what the state might have done with these resources in terms of funding health care, public schools, Head Start centers or food stamps. 